if people don't trust scientists because we think that it's okay to manipulate or to kind of over-exaggerate data because the ends justify the means, well, when we come to our next problem, they're not going to trust scientists. They're not going to trust science. Welcome to the Tom Nelson Podcast. I have Dr. Matthew Wileke here. And Matthew, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, Tom, thanks for having me on. Yeah, so I'm a faculty member at the University of Alabama in the Department of Geological Sciences. I have a PhD in geochemistry from the University of California, Los Angeles, and I've been a faculty member here since 2016. Just for fun, you are just fresh off an appearance on Fox and Friends? <laughs> yeah. Tell us right. about that. Yeah. Fox and Friends first today interviewed me about a post I had made on Twitter about some of the reasons why I'm leaving the University of Alabama, we're moving to Colorado. And so I made a post because there were some folks that said that they had, they heard that I was leaving, they were gonna talk about it. So I figured I should preemptively just have it from my own words and explain why this is happening before some information gets out there that isn't the case. And it seemed to get a lot of traction on Twitter all of a sudden, close to 2 million impressions, I believe. And all of a sudden uh, my inbox was full of interview requests. And so, I went on Fox and Friends first this morning to talk a little bit about some of the decisions I'm making and leaving the university. That's amazing. Do you think this would have happened with a Twitter as of eight months ago or so? Would it have been you suppressed? Know, I, I, it, that's, that's a really great question. So I, I really started kind of speaking up about climate, which we'll probably talk about in a minute, on TikTok. Because I had asked my students, what social media do you use? I'd love to, to kind of interact with more young people. And I, I didn't really see them much on Facebook and things like that. So I, and they all basically said TikTok. We all use TikTok now for social media. So I started making some TikTok videos talking about certain aspects of climate and trying to ease people's minds that, look, there's challenges and things, but let's not overblow this and call this some sort of crisis or catastrophe. And then I got shadow banned on TikTok on August 8th of this last year. I saw my views went from 2 million a month to 200,000. And so I really think they just took the decimal place on this algorithm and moved it. And you saw this with comments, you saw this with views, you saw this with profile views, with interactions. They give you all these statistics on TikTok. They're, they're very nice about the analytics. And it's just remarkable to watch this thing growing, 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 and then just cratering on August 8th, and then everything stays flat from there on out. And then when Elon buys Twitter, I say, oh, maybe I should start speaking a little bit on Twitter because hopefully this wouldn't happen. And it appears that it, it's not happening as of yet. I still, you know, I, I hold hopes that we can have these open discussions. I don't think words are violence. We should be open to discussing ideas and, and have a free exchange of ideas. So I, I worry that it probably wouldn't have happened if this was a few months ago. But I'm fortunate that it appears that at least some people think that this is a good idea to have an open exchange of ideas. And luckily yeah. that person is wealthy enough to buy Twitter. Fantastic. Another Twitter thing you took advantage of was a Twitter space, right? And you had a lot of people listening to that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to figure out how to interact with folks. I mean, it's hard to talk about some of this stuff in 150 characters, right? Or whatever the limit is. So this Twitter space is kind of was like, oh, well, maybe I can do some more interactions, almost like a live podcast. And so I'm thinking about exploring that a little more, maybe doing weekly lectures on there where I can interact with folks and just discuss a whole bunch of different topics, but people could interact and ask questions in live while it's streaming and things like that. So it's something I'm exploring. I'm still kind of learning about it, but I, I hope to take advantage of it more in the future. There's a lot of people now that are doing live streams, doing regular live streams, and they have regular audiences that are there asking questions and stuff. And it's, it's a great thing. Great way to share info. Yeah. Yeah. I really love the interaction part. I mean, I, I, that's, I really push my students to interact with me when I'm giving lectures and things, and it just makes the discussion's so much more fun. We go off on weird tangents sometimes that we talk about things that we never really thought we would talk about. And you're thinking of a podcast, you said, too, maybe? Thought, thought no, no, no. It. The podcast space is pretty pretty dense right now, but it does seem like a good media. It's definitely the way I get most of my information now. I mean, I, I listen to your podcast. I listen to so many news podcasts and long-form interviews that I think have gone away now, right, where the media is so... 10 second sound bites, right? My Fox and Friends was like a minute and a half or oh. something. And then they go to a next topic, right? And so it's like these rapid fire, short attention span stuff. So I, I enjoy the long form interview style that you can get with podcasts. So it's something I'm exploring, but my goal would be to reach young people. Whatever media I can do that young folks are going to see. And I, I still don't know whether Twitter is going to be that. I, I, it appears that Twitter is still pretty dominated by adults. 
you know, oh. not young adults, but, but folks my age and, and things like that. But TikTok was for a much younger audience, do you think? Yeah, so yeah. it seemed that TikTok had a much younger audience. They give you the metrics too, which is something I don't think that Twitter does. I could see the, the metrics of the age groups of my followers on TikTok. They showed by decade, I think, the age groups. And it definitely appeared that I was reaching more young people there than I do on Twitter. But again, being shadow banned, it, the videos just don't get any views anymore. Now, have you tried tried Facebook and Instagram and other places? No, I, I'm not. I don't have any. I don't have a Facebook. I don't have Instagram. I'm really just here on Twitter and, and on TikTok. I really just started TikTok because I asked the students, how could I get, reach a young audience? And that's what they told me. So I wasn't really big on social media before. So do you want to talk at all about the details of that thread you put up about why you are leaving? Yeah, yeah. sure. So I gave essentially three reasons. The first reason is pretty personal. It's when, when COVID came around, all our, my wife and I's family are in California. That's where we grew up. It just, it made us realize that it was really difficult for them to come visit here in Alabama. It's two flights, then an hour and some of driving. All our folks are in their mid seventies now. And they're, they're just, it's tiring to have them come out here. And what I noticed was my, my children, my five and seven year old boys were growing up without really seeing their grandparents. And I'm a Polish immigrant. We immigrated here when I was really young. I know what it feels like to kind of grow up without having your family around. My family was so far away. And for we, we immigrated in 1983, and there was seven years there that before the Iron Curtain fell that my parents couldn't even go back and see our family and things like that because we were afraid that if we showed up, they wouldn't let us leave again. And so I, I started to resent myself a little bit for choosing my career over my family's time together. So that started to wear on me a little bit, but my father was a professor. I pretty much since the age of 10 was going to be a professor. That's my, it was my goal ever since I could remember. I, anybody would ask me, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do what my dad does. I'm going to be a professor. That's just kind of, I, I, I had that. It was already known. I just, it was guaranteed. It was a, what I was going to do. I wasn't going to let anything stand in my way and getting here and starting this profession, getting into academia and seeing how it's dramatically changing from when my dad was there made me really start to question now, is this the career path that I'm willing to sacrifice the time with my family? If this career was amazing and, be, and, and it was everything I imagined it would be, it made, maybe made the move a little bit harder. But there's just been a dramatic change in the academic culture. And a lot of this is just what I called the rise of illiberalism in my thread. My, I, I noted that there's just this focus on immutable characteristics like the amount of melanin in someone's skin, it becomes how we frame almost every decision in academia now. We literally look at all of our decisions through the DEI lens. And to me, that's crazy. And especially on the week after we celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, you know, birthday, to think that the academic institutions that he was a big fan of are now judging people by the color of their skin and not the content of their character, I think would make him furious. It, it blows my mind. So all, I kind of included all of this stuff in the thread and that made this decision a little bit easier for me. Of course, the media loves to run with the rise of a liberalism stuff. They don't wanna talk much about moving closer to family because that doesn't get stir the pot as much. So the news really wanted to talk about this kind of rise in a liberalism, which, which did help to drive my decision. Excellent. So do you think this is fixable? This whole, is the pendulum going to swing the other way back to rationality or what's going to happen here? I, I, it, it scares me that even at a place like the University of Alabama, our University of Alabama is probably one of the ones that's trying to put the brakes on this stuff the most, that this stuff is creeping in more and more. At more and more every year, more decisions are being framed through a DEI lens. And so I hope that Speaking out about this, and I actually, when, when this thread came out, multiple UA professors actually emailed me saying that they're in the same position and actually thinking about doing the same exact thing. I'm actually going to meet with a group of them on Friday. And maybe it's going to take some of us to kind of leave the profession and make a little noise such that it starts to shine the light on this stuff and more people feel okay to speak out. But, you know, right now, Speaking out about this stuff is essentially career suicide in academia. So until we end that, 
where you can openly discuss this stuff and talk about the outcomes that some of this stuff is having, negative outcomes. If that's not going to destroy your career, I don't see this stuff stopping. It has, we have to allow people to at least discuss this stuff openly and not alienate them, call them white supremacists if they have any questions about this stuff. Until that happens, until we can have a free exchange of ideas and a discussion, I don't see this stuff going away. Okay. And you see DEI as a big problem in academia and in science, both? Are the same it's thing? remarkable what, how it's infiltrated into STEM. It was in the humanities for a long time, and it had been growing in those types of departments. And there was a recent article that I posted on Twitter from the scholars, National Academy of Scholars, that showed just, they did a very simple thing of looking how many times certain words were used in STEM grants and papers. And the, the exponential growth of this stuff in STEM was remarkable to see. It, it really did kind of shock me. But then again, being in an earth science department, I did see that we start, we're starting to frame nearly every decision through this lens. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised that it's infiltrating, it, but I'm very concerned that the outcomes that it's having are actually the exact opposite of what the intent is. I think the intent is probably good. I think these people want to include more folks. I get it. I understand that. That's probably the good intent. But the outcomes are, are not what, what they expected. The outcomes are alienating people. Less people are collaborating in faculties. People are walking on eggshells because they're scared to communicate with each other lest they say something wrong and be called a white supremacist. And so this is having the exact opposite of trying to you know, make people more communal and collaborative and, and working together. This is doing the exact opposite. I think there's been evidence now that it's happening in the corporate world too, that you're seeing this stuff have the exact opposite effects that what the intent was. So I just recorded a podcast with this journalist named Donna Laframbois. She was saying that in the IPCC itself, it's a huge problem, this DEI type of stuff, because they weren't looking just for scientific merit to put people in positions of authority. They're looking for people who met the right requirement. And they ended up with people who um, didn't necessarily know much about the subject at hand. And they had people from inside the IPCC that were admitting that, that they have people who, who don't really, they're nice enough people, but they don't know much about the subject. So again, I don't know if you have a thoughts on the IPCC or where that's going, probably the same way. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I follow her on Twitter. I've seen a yeah. lot of her good reports on the IPCC. I think people got to remember that this is a governmental panel. This is bureaucrats and policymakers that are going and recruiting scientists that fit a certain narrative. And if they want them to look a certain way, I guess that's their prerogative. It doesn't make any sense to me. I would rather get at the truth and learn something than try to get at the truth with the right makeup of people that I, I, I don't really focus on that. I, I don't think that the amount of melanin in someone's skin has anything to do with whether they're a good scientist or not. You know, oh, yeah. so I, I'm not surprised that the IPCC does things like that. It doesn't surprise mm -hmm. me one bit. And we can get more into why I don't like the IPCC at all. I didn't listen carefully enough about your plans from here. You're leaving your university, but from there, who knows? Yeah. Luckily, we had made some decent investments, so we were able to purchase a home in, in Colorado. We're re we have to rent it for a year. So we purchased that last summer. And I, I don't know, I hope to, to continue to teach, maybe somehow online, maybe community college. I don't know if they'll take me now with the, if they search my name. I, I, might, I may have tainted myself. My father has been a business professor, so we've always knocked the idea around of starting a business and running a business together. And so the truth is, I don't really know. Just before we started the recording, I was mentioning that Lawrence Krauss was saying that the way to succeed in science is to rock the boat, and that's how you can win the prizes, et cetera, that you should go against the grain. But you don't agree with that? I, I don't see that as a common way for the people that I see advancing in the field. I think that rocking the boat tends to actually hurt your career more than it helps your career. Right now, I think that there's a lot of self-preservation in academia because folks are so nervous about possibly saying the wrong thing or being labeled in the wrong way. And so I, 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 I would disagree with that. I don't think this will help me in my academic career. Is this your first TV appearance that you just did? Yeah, yes, that was the first time. And I actually, in my inbox this morning, was invited to go on Jesse Waters' primetime tonight, actually. Okay. And so they're trying to find if there's a studio they get me to to put me on. But yeah, that 
to this morning was the first time I'd ever done anything like that. I had done a few podcasts, like okay. Dr. Mike Hart's podcast, but never any sort of television appearance. Do you have any plans to go to the Heartland Climate Conference that's coming up in about a month in Orlando? No, no. I mean, I, I, I'm going to follow it closely. I, I'm intrigued by those things. But there's just too many changes coming up here in the next few months with our move and things like that, that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow it along, but I, I don't plan on attending. Do you want to cover anything that you covered in your Twitter space or you just talked about climate skepticism in general? I heard the first part of it, but not all of it. Yeah. So I guess the last on the last Twitter thread was the last reason I gave was what I said was the the silence of the earth science community on the narrative of climate catastrophism. Right. Even though a lot of my colleagues that I talked to all agree that, man, this stuff has gotten a little bit overblown and the science doesn't really back up all this stuff. And there seems to be a pretty big mental health toll on young people. They dare not speak up. And this maybe goes back to your question before that. They're not rocking the boat. They're not rocking the boat because they're scared that by rocking the boat, they're essentially going to taint themselves and they're going to get blacklisted. They'll get blacklisted from funding agencies and they'll get blacklisted from academic institutions. And so even though there is quite a bit of sentiment in the earth science community about the negative impacts of this constant catastrophism of weather events and this never-ending drumbeat of, of a planet on fire, they dare not speak out. And so I, that frustrates me. I see some of these very vocal people on Twitter, very climate alarmists, and I go to my conferences where we have big earth science conferences like the American Geophysical Union, AGU, and I look over and I see these folks pushing a stroller with like a one and two year old. I'm like, wait a minute. If you think that this planet's going to collapse in eight, 10 or 12 years and you brought a child into this world, mm, wait a minute, something doesn't really add up here. And I get it. They, they claim, well, look, what's the harm? Okay, maybe it's a little overblown, but this will just bring more attention to it. And this will just bring more research funds. And I think scientific integrity is more important. There's going to be a new problem after this. And if people don't trust scientists because we think that it's okay to manipulate or to kind of over-exaggerate data because the ends justify the means, well, when we come to our next problem, they're not going to trust scientists. They're not going to trust science. And I think this upholding scientific integrity is much more important than trying to you know, convince folks or, or to invigorate more people to jump on board on the bandwagon that the planet is on fire. You were talking about in the back channels, people will say things. They'll talk about what is the truth, but then they'll say, I don't want to say it in public because I don't want to rock the boat. But there's this dynamic. I think I'm hearing this from a lot of people. There's that dynamic. And then they retire and then the floodgates open. Hey, I'm retired. Now I can start speaking. Absolutely. It's you see that with folks like you've yeah. talked to, right? Like to Richard Lindzen yeah. and people like William Happer. And you have some tenured faculty members that will speak up, Dr. Roy Spencer and things like that. But definitely untenured faculty members, which dominate, I mean, it's assistant professors that really dominate the field. We, our lips are sealed because you don't have tenure yet. You're on the chopping block. So you, you started speaking out in public, even though you're a young guy, far from retirement, you spoke out just because the truth is important. I'm guessing that's the reason or? Yeah. And yeah. I, I realized that the field wasn't what I had expected. It changed dramatically from when my father was there, from what I hoped that I was getting into. And if the consequence was that I was going to get axed from the, from the field, maybe that was worth it. Maybe it was worth to speak up because it seemed like I planned on leaving anyway. This wasn't really what I thought it was. And the, the, just the amount of illiberalism that I was seeing was something I didn't want to be a part of. So what do you think about the whole safety and numbers things? I'm hoping that if people like you continue to speak out, it might encourage the next person to speak out and kind of snowball. I, I'm hoping for something like that. I, I'm hoping for that as well. I'm a little bit hesitant about that. I, I, I opened my email today, and although I had quite a few interview requests that were pretty positive, I also had a couple dozen emails that basically told me I was a racist and a white supremacist and you name it. And so I, I can't imagine that folks are going to keep pushing this narrative if that's the response that people get, or even questioning the narrative if they're gonna get attacked like this. I mean, it really is remarkable, the amount of hatred that folks have online. I get it, they're passionate, these are young, it's a lot of these are young folks, they're very passionate, they've been sold this idea that if they don't do, if they don't glue their hand to a painting, that the planet is gonna burn, right? And so I understand their passion. If I was probably 20 something right now, I'd probably be with them. 
I'd probably be there gluing my hand to a painting. I, I don't blame them at all. I blame, I really blame the adults for not speaking out. So I really hope that you're right, that more adults in the community start to call this stuff out. It doesn't mean that there aren't challenges. It doesn't mean that we should just forget about being good stewards of the environment. It just means that humans don't make good decisions when they're in a crisis mode, right? We have fight or flight response because that kind of kicks in when we're in danger, when we're scared, when we're in a crisis. But we know that humans don't make good decisions in these mental states. And so to put all of this on young people and to make them so anxious and to kick in all of this anxiety, especially during a time when we had a pandemic, I think it's just, it's really ha taking a toll on the mental health of young people. So I, I get the passion about climate and I, I don't blame the young folks for believing this stuff. I really blame the adults for not speaking up. And I hope, like you said, safety in numbers, if more of us start to do this, they can't come after us all. So maybe this will start to open the floodgates. I think with podcasts like yours and with what, what Twitter is, you know, what Elon's doing with Twitter, you are starting to see more people openly discussing this stuff and not being as scared as I think they used to. Yeah, I, I just think it's straight up evil to scare little kids, 10-year-olds that can't sleep because of climate change. There's a lot of evil parts of the climate scam, but that's so evil. Yeah. The mental health toll is remarkable. I mean, I had female students telling me they're not going to raise a family. Th their entire life, they thought they were going to have kids. They were excited to have kids. They had four brothers and sisters. And now they would never bring a child into this world because that child would never be able to survive. And it just shocked me that we're, this is, this is what we're telling, we're robbing these young people of their ambition, of their hope. And why were they, why would they sacrifice now to make good choices so that their future was bright if they don't think they have future? I'm really curious because you've had these uh, discussions with college students. So what are you seeing? Are you seeing some climate realists too, or what are the percentages in terms of the people that are buying into it versus not buying into it? Yeah, I, it's hard for me to say because I think a lot of these students are still a little bit nervous about speaking out. And so I, I, I try to poll them kind of as I speak individually. I'll never ask the class, raise your hand if you, because I, they don't really want to, I don't want to identify anybody and try to get in, in, in some trouble or anything. But I, I would say that in Alabama, it's not bad. I would say it's probably maybe just over half are, are really, really concerned with climate. The other half are slightly, if not mediocrely concerned. Very few people that I talked to said that they had a positive outlook on what the future might be for them, but their anxiety was really, really high. Yeah. That, that makes me sad. Yeah. It makes that's me very sad. Yeah. Okay. Especially I have five and seven year old kids and if that's, I, I don't want to rob them of their ambition and they're already getting this stuff. Already they're seeing this stuff, but at that age, and it's just shocking to me that the adults are letting this stuff happen. In the classes you were teaching, did you cover the actual climate debate issues much, or it was separate classes that weren't related? Yeah, so I to, teach yeah. two courses or right now. I'm teaching uh, an introduction to geology, which we call Intro to the Dynamic Earth. And then I teach a sustainability course, what we just call Sustainable Earth. And so in both of those, we spend two or three lectures kind of laying out the climate change debate. I give them all of the, the plots from NASA, NOAA, and all, all, all on one side. I also show them that there is another side that they don't see very often in the media. And I tell them, look, I'm not here to convince you one way or another, but I'm going to give you all of the information. And in my opinion, I don't see compelling evidence that you should think the climate is in a catastrophe or in a crisis, but you know you should be making up and coming to your own reasonable conclusion. Allow yourself to be open. Allow yourself to change your mind if you find new evidence and and new things come to light. But you know I'm gonna I'm not there to try to convince them one way or another. But I will show them that there there are multiple sides to this, and this isn't a one sided argument, and that they should ingest all of that information, and then they should make a reasonable conclusion that they're comfortable with. But always allow yourself to change your mind. One thing that I think in science that we, we really suffer from is this idea where you plant your flag in one spot and you can't move that flag again. You're not allowed to change your mind or, or think about the nuance. It's, it's really black or white, and it's especially in climate. I mean, it's remarkable that gender has, there's a million different genders and there's a whole spectrum for genders, but climate is binary. And it's either the planet's on fire or the climate change doesn't exist. There's a whole spectrum in the middle that is lost here. 
it's, it blows my mind that you can have so many genders, but you can't have differing opinions on climate. I don't understand how that works. That is a great point. What has been the feedback then from either the students or the faculty, et cetera? Do you, are you getting pushback like you're an evil person for presenting any part of the other side or not? So the feedback from the students has been overwhelmingly positive. They're very receptive. I have had a few on like rate my professor, just say he's a climate change denier. So I, maybe some people don't like it. But, you know, I do try to frame this in a way that lets them come to their own conclusion. I'm not pushing them in one way or another. And they were very receptive to that. They were really receptive to the fact that I wasn't there to try to scare them. Because everywhere they looked, they, were, they felt like people were trying to scare them into changing their behaviors. And so I, I, I think the, the, the reception was overwhelmingly positive. I've had quite a few emails from students saying that, thank you, I've started to explore this a little bit more. And although I still am concerned, I think this is an issue it, you've put me at ease a little bit. I really do think my future is bright. I'm excited. And I haven't heard much from faculty. I have or from the administration or from faculty. I have heard from some colleagues and things that I would send them my lectures and say, hey, if you're, you're given a climate science lecture, here's how I'm approaching this now. And I've had quite a good reception with that. I said, hey, that's a good idea. Let's frame this in a way that doesn't really freak people out. Maybe this they'll be a little bit more receptive to this. So over, overall, I think the response has been positive. Uh, of course, there's the folks that just say, hey, he's a climate denier. And, and that's where the conversation ends. Or he, he works for the fossil fuel industry. I've, I've never gotten a penny from the fossil fuel industry. Not that I wouldn't take it, but my, my funding has been NSF and NASA. Uh, that, that's been the two agencies that have funded me. And that's kind of why I felt like I could speak out about this too, because I'm not, I'm not a climate scientist. I do the, I use the same techniques in isotope geochemists that much of climate science is based on. I do a lot of field work and things like that. But I felt like I could have an expert objective opinion about this stuff because I wasn't in one camp or the other. So I don't benefit by picking one side or another in any way. And that allowed me to kind of take this objective look about this stuff. And so reception's been good, but oh, you always get some folks that they can't take it. They hear some, someone asking questions and automatically you're a heretic. Was there any moment that you switched over towards being more skeptical of the narrative? Or did you ever really believe that CO2 was the climate control knob and the earth was too hot? Anything like that? I, I, I bet you I was. I mean, I was always just as a scientist, I, I, my, my advisor always push me, be skeptical, always be thinking about what's going on, always be skeptical. But the truth, I, 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 you know, I kind of accepted the narrative. I, I, I hadn't had kids at the time when I, during my PhD and things, and I wasn't really thinking about the mental toll that it was taking on people, even though I had to go to therapy during my PhD. And I thought, well, this is stress because of my PhD and stuff like that. And I, I should probably go to therapy. I take advantage of this because UCLA has these great therapists and you, you could do this as a graduate student. They had a certain number of times. You could go talk to someone. And I'm a big proponent of speaking about this. You should exercise your the brain. It's a muscle and we need to think about how we're treating it. And I look back now and I wonder how much of my anxiety and my fear, which I was putting on the completion of my PhD, was also being fed into from this narrative that I was constantly hearing, especially at UCLA, right? I mean, this was a, a narrative that we were being pushed really hard. I, I never really considered the negative effects. I was probably like one of these climate scientists today that say, ah, but what's the harm? It probably isn't all of this stuff, but what's the harm that could cause? And as, I, as you grow older and you start to see the negative effects that it's having on folks. And I started to think about my own mental health when I was a student. And I just, I, it made me realize that maybe the, the negative effects are outweighing the positive effects, which I don't really know what they are. CO2 keeps rising like crazy. We have these conferences every year, right? One cop after the other, and CO2 keeps climbing. It's we're doing anything to limit CO2. The Western world has essentially taken CO2 and shipped it to China, right? Because it's essentially manufacturing. And so, yeah, the Western world has dropped its CO2 emissions by 20 or 30%, but not because they're actually dropping their CO2. It's just because they moved manufacturing over to China and India. And now they're making all the widgets that we used to make. And instead of us making them at a lower carbon footprint, they're making them with a higher carbon footprint. CO2 keeps going up. We keep buying the widgets and we keep talking about CO2 being the control number.
Okay. I mean, if, if, if CO2 is really the control knob and people have been pounding this drum, what a failure because CO2 keeps climbing and it's climbing at a faster rate now than ever. I mean, they have failed. Well, it's starting to level off a little. But what a failure if it's really them trying to slow down the growth of CO2. Yeah. So in terms of the negative effects, there's all the negative mental health effects of selling the climate crisis. But how about like taking away the, the farmland in the Netherlands, putting farmers out of business and their excuse is climate reasons, or blocking fossil fuel projects in Africa so people in Africa can't have reliable power because you're trying to prevent bad weather? I think those are just incredibly bad negative consequences of the climate scam. That's one reason why I'm fighting it. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. I actually went to second grade in Mogadishu in Somalia. I lived there for one year. My parents took us there in 1986, long before there was any conflict or anything. And I saw the poverty that these people were, were dealing with. And the poverty that they're dealing with is directly tied to access to cheap energy. When I teach this course in sustainability, we show so clearly, the data is so clear that if you provide people with access to cheap energy, you grow infrastructure, you lower mortality rates, you, you lower fertility rates so women start having less children because they don't need to have as many children because they're not going to lose one of them but before the age of five. Everything changes with access to cheap energy. To think that we're going to keep these people in abject poverty because they sh and, and tell them they shouldn't explore the, and, and, and go after their own natural resources, wait a couple decades until we make a whole bunch of solar panels and then we'll deliver them to you, that's the opposite of equitable. I mean, you are holding these people in abject poverty because what? Do you think that the 2.1 billion people on the planet that don't have access to clean drinking water give two you-know-whats about degree two or three of warming? Absolutely not. These folks need access to cheap energy and energy infrastructure and to pretend that we're going to go there and build a bunch of solar farms and wind farms and they're going to somehow integrate that into their electrical grid is absurd. It's evil, and it's going to keep people suffering for a lot longer than they should. Fantastic. You really lay this out very well. I'm just thinking as you're talking, are you willing to do public debates? Have you thought about doing debates in public or doing public presentations, either in person or I guess already you're thinking about TV? Just any of that stuff. I'm interested in your plans and those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I enjoy talking about this stuff, but sometimes I watch some of these folks debate. You see some of these folks, and man, they're, they're quick. And it makes me nervous sometimes to think about debating some of these folks. But I think that if the discussions tone down a little bit, if the ad hominem and personal attacks go away a little bit, then I'd probably be a little bit more open to it. But I worry that debates a lot of times kind of degrade into just basically people just planting their flag on one side and the other and never trying to come into the middle and discuss anything in the middle. I really enjoyed, did you see Bjorn and on the Lex Friedman podcast? Uh, was with, it uh, Revkin or who was yeah, it? Yeah, Andy Revkin. I saw a couple of minutes, I think. I, I need yeah, to that was a really that. great discussion yeah. that they had. And, it, and so I, I'm, I'm open to more kind of discussions. I don't like to frame things really as debates. I'd rather have these as discussions, even though in a discussion you do a lot of debating. But so I'm open to that stuff. I, I, I would be excited to discuss this stuff. The more I think we can share this message, the better. I would love to see tons of debates on the issues because I saw an old video of Malcolm Roberts talking to Brian Cox, and it was all, it was not about the issues really. It was what other crazy things does Malcolm Roberts believe in? Yes. Let's talk about Sandy Hook and landing on the moon and stuff, not about our tornadoes getting worse and is, right. the, is the earth too hot, all that stuff. Yeah. And we'd like to distill people down to like their one bad tweet or their one yes. bad idea. And if you distill someone to their worst idea, then everybody's terrible. Right. I, I don't try it. I don't distill folks down to their their only their negative things. And everybody's made had stupid ideas. Everybody's had good ideas. Everybody's put their foot in their mouth. I try to kind of look at people in a more holistic way. And I may not agree with you on this, but I may agree with you on this. That's perfectly OK. I consider myself a pluralist. I'm more than happy to go about my day disagreeing with you on this. It's not going to really affect my life. I think we can agree to disagree. And that's OK. Are there any favorite points that you'd like to make if you are given like a minute or two and they, on some TV channel, they say, what do you think about climate? Do you have that ready to go? Or? Yeah, I think that the main point that I would make is that if you look at the emergency database, which keeps track of things like extreme weather and natural disasters, the last 22 years, the time period when 
the average global surface temperature and the atmospheric CO2 concentration has risen the fastest, there has been no increase in extreme weather events or natural disasters. And this is really why they frame this as a crisis, right? You have to frame this as a crisis by saying that humans are going to suffer. There's going to be mass migration and people will lose their life because of all these extreme weather events. And I say, okay, you predict that. You've been predicting that for decades. So let's look at the data because I can't test a prediction. Prediction isn't science to me because it's untestable. I can wait and we can see what happens, but I can also just look at your past predictions. And when I look at the past predictions from things like the IPCC, over the last 22 years where we really have good data, I'll steel man the other side here in a second. But over the last 22 years where we have good data, we have seen no increase, right? Roger Pilkey Jr. loves to talk about this stuff. And he shows how they're going to change. They won't, they won't really show that data. What they'll show is that the costs of natural disasters have increased dramatically. Well, of course they have. Hurricane Ian, if it came and hit Fort, Lauder, or Fort Myers in, in, in 1980, would have caused dramatically less damage than it did last year, not because the storm was weaker in 1980, but because there was less stuff for the storm to destroy. So using cost is a very disingenuous way to, to try to convince people that weather disasters are growing. Let's just look at the number of weather disasters. And there is the Center for Research in the Epidemiolo Epidemiology of Disasters. I think they're in Brussels. That keeps this database. And they're looking at the health effects. But in order to look at the health effects, you have to count how many of these there are. And they don't show an increase in the last 22 years. Now, the steel man, other side of the argument, will say, okay, but zoom out. Why don't we look at this picture from 1960 to, 19, to 2020? If you do that, you do see an increase in the prior decades up until about the 90s. And then this plateau and actually a decrease. And so they say, well, look, there you go. That's evidence that the rise in CO2 is driving extreme weather. But when you go into these databases and you look into these centers, and so another one is the, office, the UN Office of Risk Reduction, in, in the Uni in a Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR, they use the same database. If you go in and read the fine print, they're very open that anything before the 90s has to be taken with a grain of salt because there's a severe underreporting that was going on prior to the 90s. In the 60s, if there was a flood in the Congo, it probably wasn't recorded somewhere in Brussels. So we have to be careful when we look at that old data. But let's assume that they're correct. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, and I'll say every natural disaster was, in fact, recorded from 1960 to 2022. What that means is that there was a correlation at the beginning, but that correlation no longer exists because when CO2 is rising the fastest and temperature is rising the fastest, we actually now see decreasing extreme weather events. I mean, it's relatively flat, so I, 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 I should actually not say decreasing, just no increase in these weather events, which essentially disproves causation. Things can be correlated, but causation is a much different point. And I warn people that that's a very important distinction. If you want to prove causation, you should have a measured and repeatable response in one variable to the change of another variable. We are not seeing that. This is not, this can't be considered a crisis if you're claiming that extreme weather is what's going to cause the crisis. The data doesn't support that claim. Excellent. Yeah, very well said. That's more than one or two minutes, uh, but. Th no, that's great stuff. I like to look at the site, Our World and Data. I look love at it. all sorts of stuff. You can look at anything. There's so many rabbit holes or so many different areas you can check out there. I love looking at uh, poverty and crop yields, et cetera. And you can't find the climate crisis out there because there's not one. I use it yeah. in my sustainability course all the time. And did you see on Twitter that one of them, one of the main people posted something that our data is being misconstrued as <laughs> suggesting that natural disasters are killing less people. No, no, your data shows that natural disasters are killing less people. Nobody's misconstruing that. Pretty it's pretty self-evident. Yeah, I think Bjorn Lomborg likes to say that their deaths from natural disasters are down 98% over the last 100 years, something like it's that. It's remarkable, the yeah. decrease. I mean, it's just an exponential drop. And of course, that's not monocausal. Yes. This yes. is complex yes. infrastructure, warning systems, you name it. But remember that the population has almost tripled since then. And yet less and less people 
are losing their lives from these. I think it's a great way, that, a, a great thing that shows human ingenuity. We are a really ingenious yeah. species. We're really adaptable. We can solve so many of our problems with technology. Never in the history of humans has our answer to any challenge been prohibition. Stop doing something. Right? Imagine in the 70s in Los Angeles when there was smog everywhere. If somebody came out and said, we need to get rid of all the cars. We need to stop driving. That would have been absurd. Nobody would have said that. What do we do? We, we, we invent things. We invented a catalytic converter. And we started to use technology to help relieve smog. And if you go to Los Angeles today, it looks dramatically different than it did in the 90s. This idea that we should solve our problems by prohibition is remarkable. There are more people being affected because there just are more people on the planet. Yeah. Right. So every year, more and more people experience some sort of extreme weather event. And we start developing a lot of times in places that maybe we shouldn't. Right. Look at the growth in Florida and things like that that's in, in the path of a lot of hurricanes. So even though you're not seeing this growth in the number of events, I do understand how people feel that yeah. these things are occurring more and more. And so I understand that. And I blame the media a lot for that. But, you know, that's been the media forever. If it bleeds, it leads. So I, I realize that people have this feeling, but you really kind of have to separate your feelings and start to objectively look at the data. And the data doesn't support that there's going to be this dramatic increase in extreme weather. I mean, you hear Al Gore talking about billions of people migrating. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I see people migrating. Why geopolitics? Not because yeah. of a degree yeah. or two of warming. Did you hear he just mentioned boiling oceans? Oh, it blew my mind, yeah, Tom. Yeah. It blew my <laughs> mind. And you're going to laugh at this because at the moment that he was saying that, I was discovering a, a new manuscript that was published six months ago in Nature that actually now predicts that in the Northern Hemisphere, there's going to be significant cooling through 2050. On the Eurasian continent, which houses half of the world's population, they're talking about like three or four degrees Celsius drop in the average surface temperature. Sea ice in the northern hemisphere goes through the roof. And at that moment that I'm reading this manuscript, I see the clip of Al Gore telling me the oceans are going to boil. And it blew my mind. So I posted about this on Twitter, and that started to get a lot of traction. And of course, the pushback always is the northern hemisphere isn't the planet. Absolutely true. But you know what the Northern Hemisphere is? It's 90% of the world's population. So if 90% of the world's population is going to be experiencing cooling through 2050, the climate alarmist folks have a real uphill battle to convince these people that what they should be worrying about is boiling oceans when they're freezing their butts off in 2040. But of course, that doesn't make, it never makes the media, right? The media doesn't want to show this new model that projects cooling. And even better, the authors, right, they come out right away and say, this no, by no way suggests <laughs> that the planet isn't continuing to warm, right? Of course, you can't bite the hand that feeds you. So you got to stick to the narrative, even though they're modeling dramatic cooling for half the planet for the next three decades. It was remarkable yeah. when I saw Al Gore doing that at the same moment I was reading that manuscript. Did you say it was published in Nature? I missed where it was published. It's in Nature, yes. I yeah. think it's in one of their Nature Climate and Atmospheres or something. They have all these little sub set journals, but it's in nature. It's, okay. it's very prestigious. So does that represent some sort of a stepping back from the climate scam a little bit that that got published? Could they have published that stuff? I'm, I, I was shocked that yeah. it did. It, it, it got through peer review, so it, and it got into nature, but the, the community kind of brushes it under the rug because it's inconvenient. So let's not talk about that much. Let's talk about the oceans boiling and, and things like that. So I was surprised to find it. I, it hadn't come across my radar. And it's been out in nature for, I think it was published in July of last year. So that, that surprised me. And then I kind of started thinking about it. And I realized, yeah, of course, this doesn't fit the narrative. They're going to bypass. They're going to skip right over this stuff right away. And if you try to talk about it, the first thing they say is, yeah, but look, the authors even admit that this has nothing implications on global warming. And global warming will continue unabated or even greater, right? Because I guess half the planet cools in order for the planet to get warmer. I didn't really understand. Interesting. What do you think might happen by 2050? I think people, when they look back at this hysteria, if they're still alive in 2050, they're going to be remembering that they never really bought into it, that other people bought into it, but they were too smart to, to be a believer. And 
I think scientists are going to say that the media way over blew what we said and look at the little weasel words we put in there. And I think we're going to see a lot of that. What do you think? I think that's exactly yeah. right. I think you can kind of already see that when people look back to claims of cooling in the 70s yeah. and there, oh, there wasn't really yeah. a consensus. Most of us weren't saying that. Hindsight, hindsight's 2020. Um, I, I, I worry what the planet's going to look like 2050, not really because of any sort of degree or two of warming, maybe possibly cooling in the northern hemisphere. Who knows? I much more worry about things like illiberalism and the the rise of ideology again. This that scares me much, much more than a couple degrees of warming. What other main points you'd like to make before we wrap up here? I just I think that people need to objectively look at the data, remove their feelings from this, step away from the media and understand that the media is going to overblow this stuff because that's how they get clicks. And, and really step back and start to look at the data objectively and think about what possible solutions we could have to fix challenges in the future. And I don't think a reasonable solution is vision of anything that allows us access to cheap energy. There will be more human suffering without access to cheap energy, whichever way that is. I'm a big proponent of nuclear. Just just objectively look at the data. And, and I think if you do that, you, you're not going to be as as in crisis mode as maybe you think you might be. And if, if it puts people at ease a little bit, I think that would be a great way to start to open this field, to have more discussions, to tone down the rhetoric a little bit. So I just, I just encourage people to go out and start to look at some of the data that I'm sharing. It's not stuff they're gonna see in the mainstream media very much, but it doesn't make it any less factual. So thank you very much for taking the time. It makes me really happy that you're doing the work you're doing and that you might be out there on TV, et cetera. That that's a great thing. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. I for, appreciate it. For rationality. Me. All right. Talk to you next time. All right. All right. Goodbye.